Port Talbot, of course, has always been open to outside influences. There are traces of occupation here going back to the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We know the Romans were here. Uh, the main road through the town now, really, I think is still part of the Via Julia Maritima that the Romans had. Um, the people who were living here when they came were the Siluris, who were a native tribe. Um, possibly not Celtic. I suspect they may have been largely of the original inhabitants of this country before the Celts arrived. But of course the Celts coming through uh, from about 600 BC onwards, they brought in a lot of new things, among other things their language of course, because Welsh is a Celtic language. We, so Silures, Celts, Romans, then of course we have the monks coming over. The, the, the Normans of course were particularly important. The first serious date we've got, I suppose, is 1147, when Robert of Gloucester, the illegitimate son of King Henry I, actually set up Margam Abbey, and he brought monks over from France, from Citeaux, to actually um, be the first inhabitants of the abbey. It was a Cistercian abbey, so of course they were very interested in agriculture and in producing wool and this was the first, I suppose, as far as we know, industrial or commercial activity in the area because the monks exported their wool. Because, of course, in uh, 1536 or thereabouts, Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries and the abbey itself, the lands and the buildings and so on, was sold to the Mansell family, the Rice Mansell. And his family stayed here for quite a long time. Uh, so we then had the Mansell Talbots living here. In about 1836, when C.R.M. Talbot, who's the Talbot who gave the town its name eventually, C.R.M. Talbot was getting married. He decided that he was not happy uh, to bring his new bride to Penrice in Gower. He needed somewhere else as well, rather closer to the centre of uh, life, and so he built Margam Castle. The Talbot, CRM Talbot, was here for pretty nearly the whole of the 19th century. He was a very important figure. He was the father of the House of Commons eventually. I think he was an MP there for about um, oh, 60 years, something like that, a very long time anyway. Uh, he was also chairman of the Great Western Railway Company at one point. He did involve himself to a small extent in industry, but not too much. Uh, he preferred to rent out the various mineral rights and so on on the land and collect the rent, as a result of which he is supposed to have been the richest man in, in, in England, they say, but of course in Britain actually, uh, when he died. Of course, the result of CRM Talbot and I suppose the people before him, their willingness to allow people to come here and exploit the resources, even if they didn't do it themselves, was the reason why Port Talbot became so important as an industrial centre. Uh, because it was on the sea, because people travelled, there was always cross-channel um, sort of pass traffic and so on going on with uh, Devon and with Cornwall. And the main railway, of course, the Great Western Railway through to Swansea, which opened in 1850, that opened up all sorts of things, both in and out. It meant that people came in, not just sailors, you had all sorts of communities. For example, in 1850 or thereabouts, you had a huge influx of people from Ireland getting away from the, the famine there. There was a, there'd been a harbour in Port Talbot since the Middle Ages. It was known as the Old Bar of Avon. The River Avon used to curve round more at the bottom then, and it came out into the sea, not where it does now, but more or less in Taibach. And so um, it was not really very adequate. And so eventually they needed to build a new docks. They straightened the river and built the new docks where it is now behind the station. The docks were vital, of course, 1830. I mean, it's quite proper that this should be called Port Talbot. Um, I don't know how much Talbot really had to do with the, uh, the docks themselves. He was involved in setting up the original ones. Uh, and um, 
the family again were involved in 1898 when the docks had to be expanded and enlarged because of course boats were getting bigger, ships were getting bigger and drawing more water so you had to have a deeper harbour. But the, the re, as I say, the real sort of um, prize for the area was when they were able to develop the deep water harbour in the steel, related to the steelworks.
Uh, it began, I suppose you could say, with Lord Mansell's Forge, and that dates from probably about 1717 onwards. And Newton and Cartwright came over and started exploring in Tybark and looking for possible sources of, um, of coal and iron and so forth. The English Copper Company, uh, they took over from Cartwright and Newton and set up a copper works in Tybach in 1770. Where you get copper to, where you get any of these, you tend to get other industries growing up as well. Chemical works, um, they want brick works for example because they need bricks for various of the industrial processes, for lining furnaces and so on. Uh, tin works and iron works seem to tie in as well. So you have these kind of industrial groups here. Uh, in fact, you could say there was a fairly direct line through from the tin plate works to the steel works now. Uh, you know, there's a gradual procession of things going on. Yeah, the Gilbertsons of Pontadawi decided to build a steel works over here. And they built the Port Talbot steel works around about 1901. And then in due course, um, around about 1905, they sold it to the Baldwin Company. And they began to develop further. Then they also built uh, the Margam Steelworks. Um, the Port Talbot Steelworks dealt with rolling the steel. The Margam Steelworks with furnaces and so on. Uh, they actually sort of built, made the steel out of iron. After the First World War, there was um, a general depression. But um, because of that, the coal industry went down very seriously, as we know, and you had a depression everywhere. Then 1936, in the meantime, by the way, the three wise men had appeared, Guest Keen and Baldwin's, as they call them locally, the three wise men, Guest Keen and Baldwin's company, and they decided to build a, a newer steelworks, upgrade everything. Then the war came, everything was very busy, but there wasn't a lot of expansion of, of works and so on, just a lot of expansion of the work they did. And then after the war, they founded the Steel Company of Wales, which included Gaskin and Baldwin, and it also included three other companies from South Wales, and that was the Steel Company of Wales. They were into integrated mills. By now they'd realised there was not a lot of point in having lots of little bits of steel production around, so the idea was to integrate the works. There had been a previous one uh, elsewhere in England, but they decided now they would build their Welsh one here because, of course, there was already a lot of expertise. There was land available. It was inaugurated in 1947. The first steel was rolled in 1951. And from then on, while well, it stayed as the Steel Company of Wales for a very long time, it became the, steel, uh, it became the British Steel Company. It was nationalised. Then eventually that, again, was uh, sold off. And now the steel, steel works here, the Abbey Works, is actually the property of Tata, which is an Indian firm.
the, the plant as it operates now uh, produces approximately 15 megawatts of power which is the equivalent use of about 31,000 houses. We place that into the grid, the receiver of that is a, co is a company called Scottish Power and they distribute it to the uh, respective homes and where it needs to be within the national grid system. Uh, the company is now uh, owned by an en uh, energy company called uh, Good Energies. This is actually a financial section company and that's who, who I report to, the board of that company. And within that we operate with an operation and maintenance contractor here who is from the EPC contractor and it's made up of uh, Scandinavian uh, companies, Burmeister and Wayne and AET who provided the actual equipment uh, to operate the plant with. We also have uh, something like 30 uh, different suppliers of wood fuels who uh, bring in the uh, woods into the, into the plant. Uh, this uh, consists of, uh, of an umbrella company, A.W. Jenkinson, and uh, they within their organisation uh, have the leads to uh, approximately 25 to 30 uh, smaller suppliers and they, they bring the majority of our woods to us. take two or three different types of wood one being regular round wood which is as you'd see in the forest you see your regular round wood trees we have brush which is the the side uh, residue of, of, of forest and uh, probably roadside materials uh, that, that isn't good for any other type of industry it's more or less a brush wood as the name brush suggests we also uh, are licensed to burn clean recycle wood uh, this doesn't mean wood from demolitions at all but clean recycle from such as pallets or maybe packing cases from places such as B&Q and this type of places. This all, all helps to uh, it produce the, the biomass product. We are um, uh, licensed to, to, to burn clean woods and virgin woods uh, but we are really a, a, a zero emissions plant so where some plants around the world particularly in Europe are allowed to have some uh, emission content where we, we try to avoid that and we are quite heavily watched by the environmental agency in that respect. itself was um, you know, sponsored by uh, various uh, grants. The Welsh uh, government g can give some grants. The overall government uh, grants of people looking for the alternative energy sector also go through and there's also support from banks as far away as, as Japan and through Europe uh, and obviously uh, local investment as well. Um, since starting the plant obviously prices as we all know have, have gone up on both fuels uh, and on electricity tariffs but the, uh, the, the, the government's allowance uh, for plants like this does help new companies in the alternative energy sector to at least get going and get on, get on even keel. 
As regards information, we obviously have full uh, telephone, email service and whatever to, to anybody we want to worldwide. Uh, for information and help maintain and operate the plant correctly, uh, there is direct links to the provider of the plant equipment that goes back to, to Denmark and uh, they are constantly monitoring our operating regime and our temperatures and, and keep a watch on uh, to make sure that we do keep within the, the allowable parameters to look after the equipment. As regards uh, international organisations and institutions, we, we do try and we do have to operate uh, within regulations set forth for the industry, emission control, health and safety, um, we have to be careful of the environment immediately around us and we have to be careful of the people who are working with this equipment as regards health and safety. So um, everybody has to wear the, uh, the, the correct PPE, the personal protective equipment for handling the type of material we have and, uh, and also for uh, uh, hearing concessions and everything. We uh, have a contracting company on site for the operation and maintenance who have about 18 uh, people, all local uh, Welsh area people, and we have about six of them on site at, at any one time. They look after the general everyday use of the, uh, of the plant operations and maintenance wise. And we have our own consultant comes in on a weekly basis to make sure that we adhere to the health and safety regimes and we also have regular meetings with the environmental agency to make sure we take care of subjects such as surface rain water rain we can't stop coming uh, but, but we can stop it for example washing um, uh, undesirable materials on, onto the adjacent lands. My name is Manbir Singh. I am 38 year old. Uh, I am working as software engineer with uh, Cardiff University. I'm married uh, to Shelly. She's Indian as well. And uh, I was born in Ambala in Haryana state in northern India. Haliya. Name chali gayi yahan se to. First time I came to Wales in 1995 to do my MBA and went back to India in 1998. After that I came back to Wales in 2003 and uh, I start working for Swansea University first of all and then I joined Cardiff University. Um, I, I like Wales. Um, I call myself basically Indian as well as Welsh. I sport like I sport Wales in rugby, so I like uh, I love uh, Welsh rugby, and I sport India in cricket because the way they play. And same uh, I sport Brazil in football. So I don't see myself like associated with one kind of nationality. I just enjoy the sports in this way just sporting all the teams who play better you know chal theek hai thodi der baad karunga main tere phone aur batao ye sare kuch born and brought up in india my parents are still in india um my brother his family they are still there so that kind of emotional relation is always there with the family and i be, since been brought up there stayed there nearly 25 years so that kind of 
cultural things, the way I have friends there, the way I have, uh, my family connections. So all those emotional ties are always there with the family. And uh, while when it comes to just sending, when it comes to investment, sometimes just put money there and do business on economic terms. I do some investment in India, just send money back there. And uh, since I was brought in, brought in India, so I always uh, involved in politics, Indian politics, I supported Congress party because of their liberalization and secularist policies. My religion is uh, Hindu, Hinduism, I believe in Hinduism and uh, I believe in spirituality, but uh, uh, my personal belief, I just believe in secularism. I, I respect all the religions in the world and admire and like to know about them. So I have basically connection with all the religions. My friend circles, they belong to different religious people. So that's what I enjoy, a religious part of my life. When it comes to the connection back to India, uh, uh, I watch uh, Indian movies, Bollywood movies, which is, I think most of our families spend most of time watching Star TVs for entertainment. When it comes to the news, we go to Star News or NDTV News. And most of times I use Times of India as my favorite newspaper to just get up to date news about India. And when connecting to my family, I prefer to spend weekend on Skype discussing things with them so that uh, we can sit like online family discussion. And uh, same thing I do to connect to my friends. Similarly, I my friend circle on Facebook. Most of my friends and family friends uh, are on Facebook, so we keep on updating each other. And so, even staying away from all of them, but I don't really feel that I'm away from them. It, I'm most of the times I am in contact with them. Um, Oxfam, Oxfam is a global um, organisation that has been working since 1942. Our overall mission is to overcome poverty and suffering working with others anywhere we find it. In reality that means we try to ensure that people have basic rights, um, basic rights to security, basic rights to um, essential social services, basic rights to make a livelihood for, pe for themselves, pe uh, basic right to be heard and a right for, e for equity. Um, we, we currently work in 61 countries across, across the world, including three within the UK, uh, um, and we're also part of an international federation of 14 Ox, Ox, Oxfams, and collectively we work in over 100 countries between, between all of us. 
We do our work in three different ways. Probably the most well known is our emergencies work. People who are suffering um, from crises that, that, that put their basic homes and lives at risk, as in recently the, the floods in Pakistan, last year's disastrous earthquake in Haiti, and currently we're doing a lot of work in the, in the Ivory Coast to help victims of the, of, the war, of the war there and many thousands of internal refugees. We also do work in two other main areas. We do development work where we're hope, helping people to build their lives for the long term. Um, we did a lot of work helping communities in East Asia rebuild their lives after the tsunami um, from 2004 onwards. And we, we do that work on an ongoing basis across many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where we have our biggest programs in Central America, in South and East Asia, and as I said before here in, here in the UK. Um, and what we do in those situations is mostly work with local organisations, support the development of those organisations and help them build the projects that they think will help local people to meet, to meet their goals, particularly in, build, in building livelihoods and helping them get their voices heard by local governments and local decision makers so that their, their communities are actually driven by, by the needs, by the needs of, of those people. The third main strand of our work is in campaigning. Um, but however many programs we run, um, and however successful they are, they cannot address all the issues that communities suffering from poverty around the world need to address. Some issues are just too big. Um, if, I, if I take, for example, the debt crisis that um, overwhelmed many countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and in, and in Latin America, um, from really the late 1980s up until the early 2000s. That couldn't be addressed by project work. We had to campaign to address that. And we had to go to multilateral um, donors, we had to go to, to governments in the rich world, and we had to go to banks to say that actually these, po these policies are, are, are actually self-defeating, insisting that people pay back money that was often borrowed by dictators um, and insist on new democracies undermining their very existence by spending all their, their budget, budget on repaying loans rather than providing basic services for their populations. And to get that, that debt either reduced or, or, or cancelled was a long-term effort, but it was achieved by campaigning, um, by, work, by working with those, those organisations holding the debt and persuading them that actually going in the way they were wasn't sustainable. And it coming to a, a, um, a peak with the Make Poverty History campaign in 2005, we secured massive debt reductions, along, working alongside a range of other NGOs um, and other organisations um, committed to addressing world poverty. Um, and that's probably the single biggest campaigning su success we've had. And in doing that work, um, we seek allies, people who will work with us, who are other NGOs here and in and, and in developing countries. We work um, with with governments. Um, U UK government's obviously an important partner for us, and and indeed target for us. But also governments ac across the developed world, and increasingly governments across the developing world. But also then multilateral bodies, the United Nations. Um, the World Bank, the IMF, are all bodies that we that we try and influence. And so, for ma major UN negotiations, major G20 negotiations, we're often present as as accredited observers, so our voice is heard. Even though, we, as NGOs, obviously, we don't have a formal voice in the decision making process. In terms of how big we are as an organisation, well, as I said before, we we work in 61 countries. Um, in doing that, we employ around 3,000 staff, the vast majority of whom are native to the country in which they work in. Because our UK staff come from the UK, whereas, for example, our South African staff will mostly come from South Africa, our Brazilian staff mostly from Brazil, and, and, and so on. Um, we raise, we raise a, an awful lot of money to pay for that programme. Our budget last year was in the region of £320 million. Pounds. Um, that comes from a variety of sources. Uh, around a third of that, around £100 million, comes from donations. The vast majority of that quite small donations, people giving two or five or ten pounds a month in regular direct debits. Um, we received a similar amount from uh, fundraising efforts where we went to charitable trusts, we went to governments with particular project plans and they funded them. Um, and we raised about £70 million through our network of shops. We've got about 700 shops across the UK. Um, doing a, a range of 
clothing, books, uh, specialist boutique sh shops like the one downstairs here in Cardiff. Um, and they are a, a major part of our, of, our, of our fundraising and they also sell a range um, of things like fair trade goods and toys as well. And the vast majority of that money gets then spent on that program work I discussed. Um, about 40% of the program work goes on emergencies work um, and the rest goes on longer term development work. Um, and then like most charities we have to spend around 9 or 10% actually running the charity effectively, employing staff, um, making sure we comply with charitable and other and government regulations and so, and so on. Use of different forms of information technology has obviously grown massively over the last decade and, and we as an organisation and, and the people we work with are no exceptions to that. What it means for us as an, as an organisation is massive and overwhelmingly beneficial. What it, I mean, not only does it mean internally we can communicate across the globe very easily with all the different bits of our programme, but even more excitingly is what it means for the people we work with. People who before didn't have any access to media, any access to telling their own stories. It now means with um, simple emails, use of Twitter, um, and even more things like um, small-scale ca handheld phone cameras and so on. People can get their stories and their messages across. It makes um, the media a far more democratic medium than it, than it was a decade ago. RPC is Europe's largest rigid packaging polymer producer. It is positioned across mainland Europe and into the UK with a presence in North America also. It is strategically positioned to satisfy the European market operating uh, across 60 sites serving the industry. The business produces plastic packaging using all three conversion processes, that is injection moulding, blow moulding and thermoforming. Here at Kenfig we produce vending cups for the UK market. We are the UK's leading manufacturer of vending cups and also portion packs. All our products here from Kenfig are fully recyclable to address all the environmental concerns. One of the particular strengths of the operation here at Kenfig is it serves the independent marketplace and small vending operators, but also those vending operators that form into larger purchasing groups and this site supplies all the major purchasing groups within the vending industry. In addition to that, it also serves blue chip companies at Mars and Nestle and other such businesses within the UK and into the European mainland. The RPC Group recognises that it operates within a worldwide economy. Its positioning within North America through into mainland Europe and here into the UK gives us the benefit of being able to understand the influences across the worldwide economy as well as the European environment. We use our size, uh, diversification of product ranges and positioning in each, in each country to give us a position where we can evaluate and work through and gain understanding of best practice to serve ultimately best service into our customers.
Information technology is vital in running any business today. Of course, a company of the RPC size positioned across the various countries that we are in, it is vital in running our own business. And of course, we utilize all the aspects of information technology you'd expect. Email is key to us, as is the use of Skype for meetings. Quite often, uh, we have regular reviews, we have weekly and sometimes daily discussions using Skype, both the head office in the UK and also our European sites. And of course, this gives us the benefit of understanding uh, immediately the concerns and questions and best practice and initiatives that we can drive across the business. It gives us the ability to talk to people either on phone or face to face via the Skype. And as an environmental position, of course, it reduces the need for people to take car trips or train journeys or get, get a, a plane to fly across to Europe. Well, since, since the Indian Society was set up in 1983, the membership of the Society has grown uh, and as a result of that we felt we needed to include uh, a, a larger geographical area. So now we have members from the whole of Bridgend up, uh, right up to Pembrokeshire and uh, these members come together at the various events that we hold you know, for the Society. And uh, for example, you know, we have the Diwali events, which is a bit like Christmas, which is the Festival of Lights. We have the Mela Festival, which is a public festival that um, uh, invites the whole, the mem you know, the whole of the public t to come along to um, uh, partake in the, uh, uh, the diverse cultural uh, aspects of India. Uh, in addition, the, uh, the Indian Society, since it's a setup, not only does it do, do charity events, you know, for other uh, groups, such as, uh, you know, as we've uh, already said early on, you know, with regards to raising money for various uh, groups like Alzheimer's, like the uh, cancer groups, but we also collaborate with other community groups um, uh, to demonstrate some of our, some of the skills that you that we have. For example, we've recently did a cookery demonstration for Communities First, the family place uh, group where we use fresh produce to show them how to cook an Indian meal. You know, that was really well received and, uh, and they found that very interesting and they also found the taste uh, appealing as well. And, uh, in a, and we've worked with the African Community Centre, you know, on various bids. We've um, uh, also taken part in the Human Race Marquee uh, that uh, the Swansea Bay Race Equality Council tend to set up uh, on an annual basis. And uh, we've done uh, Indian dancing demonstrations in schools or, uh, for example, at the World Day. So it's this collaborative approach that allows us, you know, to be able to live together harmoniously and, uh, and also share uh, the, the difference, uh, the different cultures. Then we started the Mela, which we thought will be uh, better to bring the mainstream uh, within the community and to make aware for the youngsters and everybody about the culture and the tradition of Indians. And also for the youngsters to uh, know their roots and their cultures and they, some of the local children also learn about Indian culture in the schools, which they can relate when they come to, to the Mela festival and uh, they can see what is religion, what is tradition and what is culture and they all participate uh, in the event and you can see uh, multicultural activities going on and there's a interact, inter integration of all the communities on the Mela festival which is a big uh, achievement for the Indian society and this has been going on for the past five years. I must say that we uh, 
Indian society has grown from strength to strength and we have come so far and, and I think all the Indians in Swansea and from Southwest are very proud to be a part in the Indian society. But from Indian society I think various people, various members have come to make friends and they feel, feel a sense of belonging because we have come from our country to this and made a home in this new country in Wales and which society has helped them to get through whatever problems and whatever difficulties they have to face. And, uh, and they have a family because we don't have a family here and they made friends as family and they made many people and few of the children. Uh, Indian society has been a platform for them to, to overcome their shyness, to whatever their talents they could exhibit and portray it and also for the talented artists whom we have uh, uh, quite few members are quite talented and it was a platform for them to thereon go and become a professional uh, dancers professional in any way they would like to English helps us because uh, I think for 200 years British ruled our country and it has become our first language in our uh, country as well and everybody speaks English in India and and once that is in a way it's easier for us when we came to Swansea to England and we are able to converse with everybody. People in India are uh, because of the way we are we're having our culture, diversity in culture and languages and all and we are able to cope with anything that comes across. Uh, even when we go abroad, uh, when we leave our own mother country and go to come to England or, and, or to States as a matter, we feel that we are able to cope with it and uh, we speak different languages, we know that we speak different languages coming from the country and we know that if we meet another Indian he won't know our language so we tend to accept that and we we speak whichever is common to both of us and we tend to communicate and we have a sort of a bond and we Indians are very warm loving people we try to um, embrace other culture and other society when we go abroad and we uh, we are able to live in the environment and adapt ourselves in a, I think sooner than other, other nationality I must say. Mm -hmm.